start with a word of prayer. Why don't you stand up? Father, we come this morning, and I would ask that you would prepare our hearts. We know that when you first establish the tabernacle among your people in Israel, that you commanded them to make sure that everything was cleaned and anointed. Aaron and his sons had to wash before they could enter. Each one of the items within the temple had to be anointed. The people needed to understand that that was holy ground because that was where the cloud representing your presence was going to be staying and manifesting itself. And then later in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, it was the same. And now we know in the modern age, in the new covenant, that our hearts are your temple. Father, I pray that they would be clean. And I pray that they would be anointed and ready to receive your presence. I pray that you would speak clearly. Use me, your unworthy servant, to communicate your truth. And Father, may it be powerful. We would ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We are continuing in our series, Excavation, Unearthing the Buried Kingdom. We've already seen that the kingdom of God, according to Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, in a story that Jesus told, it's, it's like a buried treasure. And he tells a story about a, a man who just sort of happened upon it, saw it, hid it again really quickly because he knew what he was looking at, went and sold everything that he had, in order to buy the property, in order that the treasure would be his. And we talked about, just like that treasure, the kingdom of God is, is often missed. It is stepped over. It is undiscovered. The kingdom of God manifested in the modern world is the church. And it kind of makes perfect sense. How many people today are stepping over the church? How many people dismiss it? How many people look at it as having no value? Not realize the treasure that it is. And the saddest thing of all is that some of those people sit in that very church, or at least among the church, and don't realize just what they're missing. We've seen that there are certain aspects to the buried kingdom, the real kingdom. One is it's a coalition. Two, it is about recovery of the lost. Three, it is about mercy. Four, it is about desire. And the fifth thing that we're going to see this week is that it is about legitimacy. And by that, I mean this. Throughout history, God has desired to reveal himself. He wants to make himself known. He wants to make his name great. He wants the people of this world to know who he is, and to revere him, to respect him, to awe him, and yes, to fear him for who he is. That is his desire. And the kingdom of God, today the church, is the agency through which he wants to do that. He wants to use you and me and others who are also a part of his kingdom to reveal him to an outside world so that that outside world can revere him. That's what the Great Commission in Matthew 28 is about. That's why we baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Question. Does our world revere our God? No. 
No, and especially in this country. He's not revered. He's disbelieved. He is mocked. He is ignored. Now, we are the agents that he has chosen to go make his name known so that he can be revered. We now know he is not revered. His name is not known. Why? Because we have failed. We have failed to make his name known. We have failed to demonstrate any reason why the outside world should revere this God. There was a time, even in this country, when the name of God was known and it was revered. But it is not now. Is it a lost cause? Is it just, have we just gone beyond the point where his name can be known? Where he can be revered? I don't think so. But I do think it's going to take some change. And we're going to see today in the passage that we're going to be looking at that not only is it possible, but God is still very interested in people knowing who he is and revering his name. It's the same God that we're going to read about today. He hasn't changed his mind. And that's good news for you and I. Because the way God goes about making his name known and causing people to revere him is to demonstrate what he's capable of. And I think many of us have forgotten what he's capable of. We have forgotten who we are dealing with. And I think he is in the process of clearing his throat, as it were, to make his name known and to send reverence and, yes, fear into an outside world. And I think he's going to start with us. As a matter of fact, I think he already has. So let's take a look at our passage. I'm going to invite you to turn to the book of Exodus, starting in chapter 8 at verse 16. Before we get there, I'm going to give you a backdrop. Our story today takes place during the life of Moses and during Moses' interaction with the nation of Egypt where all of the Jews are currently being held as slaves. We have studied part of this story not long ago, back in October of last year during our likeness series, and we took a look at what happened with Moses and Aaron in dealing with Pharaoh and, and how the first sign that, that uh, God was going to do something to coerce the Egyptians into releasing their Israeli slaves to go to the mountain of God and worship him and, and to allow God to take them into a new land. The first thing that happened was it involved uh, Aaron throwing down his staff on the ground and the staff becoming a viper. But then we saw that the Egyptian magicians were able to do the same thing and throw their staffs down and they became vipers. And then Aaron's staff consumed the other vipers, but it didn't change Pharaoh's mind. Well, we're going to pick up the story from right there, starting in Exodus chapter 7. After that incident, the Lord commands Moses to return to Pharaoh. In this instance, he tells Moses, I want you to go down to the Nile, and I want you to wait for Pharaoh to show up, and then I have a message for him. Now, it was very common for Egyptian royalty to go down to the Nile River on a regular basis, pretty much daily, in order to bathe. The Egyptians viewed the Nile as a sacred river. And uh, we see an example of that in Exodus 2.5 when, when Moses himself got plucked out of the water 
by one of the uh, children and daughter of the Pharaoh when she had gone down to the Nile to bathe. So it was common, and so Moses is told, I want you to wait for Pharaoh, and when he comes to the Nile, I have a message for him, and you're going to deliver it for me. And the message is essentially the same. Pharaoh, you need to let my people go, release them, so that they can come worship me. Pharaoh hasn't changed his mind. So he says no. And then God had commanded Moses to instruct Aaron to take that same staff that had become a viper earlier and to strike the Nile River. More than likely, while the Pharaoh is in it. And when he does, something astounding happens. The water is instantaneously transformed into blood. And then Moses commands Aaron to take that same staff and start moving throughout the region and raising up the staff every time he came to a body of water, whether it was in a stream or a lake or a pool or a river or a canal or a reservoir, wherever it was, and as he did, that water became blood. Even water that was in containers became blood. It got so bad in Egypt they couldn't get any drinking water. They had to start digging, ferreting down by the banks of the Nile in order to get down underneath where the Nile was filled with blood and dig water out from underneath it that was being filtered by sand. That was the only way they could get anything to drink. Incredibly, though, Pharaoh summons his court magicians, and they also do the same miracle. They manage to take water and turn it into blood, which then reinforces Pharaoh's arrogance into thinking that he doesn't need to comply. And so he says no. Exodus chapter 8. Seven days later... God sends Moses and Aaron to Pharaoh to repeat his demand, and predictably, they are rebuffed. In response, the Lord instructs them to strike the Nile one more time, and this time it results in hordes of frogs coming out of the water. And they soon inundate every nook and corner of Egypt until there's no place to escape. Even Pharaoh's palace is overrun with these frogs. Again, the court magicians are able to duplicate the miracle. They, too, can draw frogs out of water. But this time, the hardship of all of these frogs becomes so great that Pharaoh's resolve is broken. So he calls Moses in, and he says, all right, I get it. I will do anything if you'll get rid of these frogs. Send them away, and I'll release your people. Moses says, all right, so that you will know that it is the Lord God of Israel who has done this. He will get rid of the frogs for you. And he'll do it in a fashion that's unmistakable. And at that very moment, every one of the frogs dies instantaneously, right where they were, so much so that the Egyptians have to begin shoveling them out and transporting them to places where they can get them out of the city. But Pharaoh, once the trial has passed, changes his mind and says, no. I know what I said, but no. I'm not going to let you people go. Which brings us to our passage, Exodus 8, starting at verse 16. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the ground. And throughout the land of Egypt, the dust will become gnats. So once again, God speaks to Moses and he gives Moses a command to give to his brother Aaron. What's interesting is this is going to be the last time that Aaron is actually going to be involved in directly bringing a plague upon Egypt. From here on, it's just God speaking to Moses, and it's going to be Moses who's the agent. But for here, Aaron is involved. He, Aaron is actually the one who does what God says. He tells him that I want you to strike the dust with your staff. And he's going to do an amazing miracle here. He's going to supernaturally transform every speck of dust into a gnat. There are some who believe that this is hyperbole, that when it says that he turned the dust into gnats, that it basically was just another word saying there was a bunch of gnats, and the gnats were as numerous as, as dust. Sort of like when God told Abraham that he was going to make his offspring like the dust of the earth. The problem is, is that in the original Hebrew, it doesn't say like the dust, it actually says from the dust. He says that the dust will become gnats. That word in Hebrew for will become is haya, and it means basically to come into being. It's the same word that was used in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, let there be light. So we have a pretty clear indication that God didn't just call a bunch of gnats from one place to another, but that he did, in fact, translate the dust of Egypt into gnats, that the gnats sprung up from the dust, and that they blackened the sky. The NIV says gnats. Some of your other translations may speak about something else, maybe lice or mosquitoes or uh, fleas. In Hebrew, the word translated gnats is cane, and it just means small insect. And it could be translated into one of those other types of insects, and and if that's the case, if that's what they were, you don't really need it explained to you why that would be a menacing judgment and plague upon a place. Um, and it is possible that it was those other things. But for reasons I'm not going to go into great detail, uh, many scholars believe that, that it's actually talking about gnats here. And when the Old Testament was translated from Hebrew into Greek, into a document known as the Septuagint. It was translated as gnats. And, and I'm going to be working under the uh, idea that it was gnats because I honestly believe that it was gnats. But lest you think that that's sort of like, well, that wasn't so bad because all of us have had to deal with a gnat at one time or another. If you've ever had an overripe banana, you've probably met the odd gnat. And it probably didn't think didn't think to yourself, well, that's all that menacing is, is a, a bunch of gnats. But uh, we need to understand a little bit about what was going on here. First of all, when you have a swarm of gnats, they're referred to as a cloud. And that's what you had here. Clouds of gnats that darkened the sky. And these were very, very problematic. First of all, gnats... Uh, as you know, are very, very tiny. They're, they're barely visible to the naked eye. And because they're so small, they present a lot of unique issues. First of all, they can infest everything. Food, water, and not to gross you out, but bodily orifices the ear canal, your eyes, your nostrils. Another thing you need to realize is that gnats 
tend to come in two categories. There are the kind of nets that we have here in North America, and they're just your run-of-the-mill gnat. Kind of a nuisance, but that's really it. But there are other kinds of gnats, and they are known as biting gnats or blood-sucking gnats. Example of them would be sand flies or black gnats. And these kinds of gnats are very different. They have a mosquito-like bite, and the result of when you're bitten by one is that it creates, like a mosquito, an, inch, an itching welt that can last up for a week. And like mosquitoes, these gnats can carry pathogens that lead to severe disease. I'll give you one guess as to what kind of gnats they have in Egypt. The biting kind. Imagine swarms, clouds, black clouds of these biting, tiny little things that are everywhere. Try sleeping at night with these things flying up your nose and into your eyes and into your ears. You can't dig them out fast enough. They're into every aspect of food you have. They're into your drinking water. They're in your house. They're in your bedroom. They're outside, wherever you go. They're there. Verse 17. They did this. They did as God commanded. Aaron struck the ground. And when Aaron stretched out his hand with the staff and struck the dust of the ground, gnats came on people and animals. All the dust throughout the land of Egypt became gnats. It says that gnats came on people and animals. What this means is, is that these gnats weren't just innumerable because... In a sense, they were just like the dust, because if you translate dust into gnats, they're obviously going to be the same number. So they're everywhere. I mean, you know how much dust there is in the air? If you don't know, let me give you a quick way to find out. Go home and dust your television set. Come back two days later and run your finger across it. You know what you're going to find? Dust. Because it's everywhere. It's omnipresent. Imagine every little speck was a gnat. So these gnats are pervasive. They are innumerable. But you know what else they are? These are very unique little gnats. They are highly aggressive. Which means that they're going to move toward anything that's warm-blooded. This sort of confirms the understanding that these gnats are blood-sucking gnats. They go after people. They go after animals. They're not just flying around. They're hunting. And it says that all the dust throughout the land of Egypt was permeated with these gnats. One strike of a staff and like a stone in a still stream, it just reverberated through Egypt. Verse 18a, and now the story gets interesting. But when the magicians tried to produce gnats by their secret arts, they could not. What an interesting limitation here. We've already seen that these magicians have been able to do some things that are fairly impressive. Moses and Aaron genuinely translate a staff into a deadly viper. They do the same. Moses and Aaron turn the Nile and every drop of water throughout Egypt into blood. They do the same. Moses and Aaron strike the Nile and a horde of frogs infests the land. They do the same. And yet, now we come to a tiny little gnat. And they can't do it. Why? Okay. Well, there's some different theories. One is that if you take a look at the wording here, this is the first one of the plagues that came unannounced. 
See, all of the other plagues, Moses had told Pharaoh, and therefore the magicians would have overheard, that listen, Moses, if you don't, or listen, Pharaoh, if you don't release the people, then this plague or this thing is going to happen to you. And this is the first time where God doesn't tell Moses, hey, listen, go give Pharaoh a warning. Instead, he says, hey, listen, he, he, he double-crossed me when I told him that I would get rid of the frogs, so here's the plague. Just drop it on him. So there's some who believe that because it came without warning, these magicians didn't have time to prepare a trick, a sleight of hand. And, the, and these people believe that everything that the magicians did was just basically a parlor trick, that it wasn't legitimate power the way Moses and Aaron had displayed legitimate power. That's possible, I suppose, but I actually believe that the wording in Hebrew demonstrates that what they did was a legitimate miracle. Is that possible? Well, of course, and I've already taught you when we studied the last time about uh, the story of Moses and, and the staff that turned to a viper, of what was going on here in Egypt was God introducing himself really to the general populace. He was making his name known, and he was causing people by what he did to put respect on it, to fear him. Did it work? Oh, yeah. Yeah. When the Israelites finally do leave Egypt and go into Canaan, the people there are already afraid of them because they've heard about what their God can do. So there was a lot at stake between Moses, Aaron, and Pharaoh and these magicians who were there in support of Pharaoh. This was a cosmic battle in which God was going to be introducing himself to the world. We're still telling this story now. That's how important it was. So it makes perfect sense that the enemy of God would try to intervene to muddy the water and that he would grant power to these Egyptian magicians who I've already taught you were scholarly about their pursuit of secret power. They didn't just study the religion of Egypt, but they studied global religion, searching for any way to cross the gap between our world and the spiritual realm in order to access power and wield it, especially dark power. So you've got willing vessels who are searching for power. You've got a real world of Satan and the demons, fallen angels, who do have power, to counterfeit miracles with real supernatural energy. It makes perfect sense to me that what these magicians did was very likely things that are inexplicable. Which brings us back to why couldn't they produce a gnat? One gnat! They've turned a staff into a viper, water to blood, frogs from the water, they can't come up with a gnat? No, they can't. And here's why. It wasn't because they didn't have advanced notice. It was because God said enough. That's it. See, the enemy can counterfeit miracles. He can do amazing things. He can masquerade as an angel of light. We see in the book of Revelation that, that when his man, the Antichrist, comes, he's going to do all kinds of powerful miracles that's going to convince the world that he himself is Christ. We know the enemy has power, but not when God says enough. Isn't it interesting that when God begins to drop plagues on Egypt and we see these magicians are able to wield counterfeit power, which essentially results in at least something 
similar enough for Pharaoh to stiffen his resolve and say, I'm not going to give in. I don't care what you can do. My guys can do the same thing. Isn't it interesting that they had the power to counterfeit what God did? But isn't it interesting that they never do something more useful, which would have been stop it? What would be more useful for you if you're the Pharaoh? These two guys show up and start making demands. They throw a staff down and it turns into a deadly viper. You guys come in. Wouldn't it be more helpful if they would just say, hold their hand up and that viper dies? Or turns back into a staff? Or at least their vipers consume that one? Wouldn't it be more helpful if these same two guys show up and turn every drop of water in your country into blood? Wouldn't it be more helpful if your magicians show up and turn it back into water? Wouldn't it be more helpful if you're being plagued by frogs to the point where you have to abandon your own palace? For these magicians to wave their hand and every frog die or disappear or go back to the Nile? Why do they just try to counterfeit? Which is, that? oh great, okay, so you made another frog. That's just what we need. One more frog. Or you, you turned the last little drop of water we had. That's now been turned into blood too. Thanks a lot. Or, oh great, now we've got five vipers on the floor and not just one. Why don't they do something more helpful? You know why? Because they can't. Listen, Satan can try to imitate what God does, but he cannot stop it. He cannot stop what God is going to do. He can try to fool you by imitating it, but he cannot stop it. And so these guys are done in by a gnat. Verse 18b, Since the gnats were on people and animals everywhere, the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not listen just as the Lord had said. It says, the gnats were on people and animals everywhere. Not a person in Egypt could escape from the plague. From the Pharaoh himself down to the lowliest creature in the field, these people were being assaulted by gnats. It would be enough to drive you insane. Imagine the terror that one mosquito can bring you on a summer's night. When you're trying to sleep, I hate the. Okay, can you imagine your room is black with these biting things? Of how insane it would be. You wouldn't be able to sleep. You wouldn't be able to live. Everyone in Egypt is being inundated with these things, and I imagine they were crying out to Pharaoh, "Please do something about this." But there was one place I believe where. These things weren't assaulting them. If you read down in the same chapter of Exodus at verse 22, God says, I will deal differently with the land of Goshen where my people live. I think God spared the Israelis the misery of these plagues. Now, when God says this, it's actually during a later plague. And I will tell you, honestly, there are some theologians who believe, well, God spared them from that point on, but before he hadn't. I got to tell you that I don't agree with that. I think the statement is pretty generic, and I believe it was retroactive. He doesn't say, from now on, I'm going to deal differently with Goshen. He just says blanketly, I'm, gonna, I, I'm dealing differently with Goshen. To me, it makes no sense for Moses and Aaron to bring one of these plagues and then suddenly suffer the consequences themselves. Wait a minute, what are we, what, Nat, what's wrong with you, Aaron? This was a bad idea. No, I, I don't think so. I think God knows how to punish the wicked and to protect and preserve the righteous. And I think that the Israelis were being spared from all of this, but not the Egyptians. And so therefore the magicians finally say to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. Think about these magicians. They have now been publicly undressed 
by the power of God. This is humiliation. You know, you imagine the Pharaoh, I'm waiting, where's the gnat? And they're like, we can't. So you've got their own humiliation. They have to get past their own humbling by God. And then they have to go to Pharaoh, admit defeat, possibly put themselves in harm's way, and say to him, Pharaoh, you're dealing with something different here. Here, Pharaoh, there's the world you understand, the political world. The world where your word is law. Then there's the spiritual world, the world that we understand, where dark forces are at play and we can bring things to bear that are supernatural and inexplicable. But then there's this being, this God of Israel. And we're playing with tinker toys. And he's above us in the heaven. And you're going to have to deal with him, Pharaoh. I mean, essentially, these magicians say, what he has done with a flick of his finger is more than we can conjure in combination with one another and more than you can do anything about too, O king. God is drawing a distinction and he is putting it into the minds of Egypt from the king on down who he is. Which, by the way, is exactly what God said would happen in Exodus 7, verse 5. He said, listen, I am going to make my name great amongst the Egyptians. I am going to put fear into their hearts. They're going to be afraid to whisper my name. God had predicted it. And yet, Pharaoh's heart was hard and he would not listen. Why? Why? Was it because the miracles weren't impressive enough? You know, if you take a look at the story of all of the plagues, what you find is, is that Pharaoh is actually broken by what God does several times. He's already been broken once by the frogs. It's just that as soon as God got rid of the frogs, he changed his mind and said, nah, I'm not going to do it. Later on, he's going to do it again and again. It wasn't that the miracles weren't powerful enough, menacing enough, spirit-breaking. His unbelief didn't have anything to do with the need for more miracles. It didn't have anything to do with logic or reason. So why is he being so stubborn? For the same reason that people are stubborn today. Unbelief is never about logic and it is never about the want of more indications that something is true. Unbelief is always about one thing. Don't forget this, dear ones. No matter what arguments people bring up for you, here's the real reason why people don't believe. It's this. Morality. Morality. It's not that they can't understand and believe that there is a God who has created everything. It is that they don't like it. They don't like it. What was Pharaoh's problem here? Was he having any problem understanding that there was a God who could do miraculous things? No, he'd witnessed that. Did he know that that being was distinct from the court magicians that he had? That he himself used to think were the most powerful beings? Oh, he has no problem now understanding there's a difference because they themselves are coming to him and saying, Pharaoh, we're outgunned. You're dealing with someone that is so far above us, we surrender. He's brought us to our knees with a gnat. And yet Pharaoh still says, no. I have no doubt that he explained away the miracles using human reasoning. 
Just like people try to explain away miracles today for that same reason. He refuses to believe because one, he didn't like the idea that there was someone more powerful than him. And two, he didn't like the idea that that someone is telling him what to do. Why do people reject God today? They don't like the idea that someone else is control, in control and that that person is telling them that they are separated from him under judgment and need to do certain things to rectify the situation. How did Pharaoh respond? He shows contempt for God's servants. He ignores and rejects God's commands. And he defiantly continues to live the way he wanted. Does that sound familiar to you? It ought to. That's how people today live and for the exact same reason. All right. How does God make his name known? How does God want to make his name known today? By legitimizing those who revere his name and who are serving him as he has commanded. God will do the same kind of powerful things today in the lives of people who are willing to serve him. That's why it is such a shame that churches seem so devoid of the power of God. That we read about it and think, boy, that must have been special, and it never occurs to us that God might still want to do transformational things that will cause an outside world to look in and say, this is the finger of God. What does it look like? When God is at work legitimizing the people who are serving him to make his name known, the first thing that happens is that it is inescapable, just like this plague. Verse 17 said that all the dust throughout Egypt became gnats. You could not get away from the gnats. Just like when God is at work, you can't get away from it. You can deny it because you don't like it, but you can't get away from it. That's why it says in Romans, men are without excuse. Hebrews 12, 28 and 29 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. When God is making his name known, he breathes fire into the people who are ready for it. And I think he still wants to breathe fire today. And I believe that when, I, I believe there are places where he is breathing fire, where people are open and seeking that. And God does inexplicable, miraculous, yes, things. Particularly in life change. The second thing that you can recognize it by, one, it's inescapable. Two, it is inimitable. Inimitable. What that means is basically it cannot be counterfeited. It cannot be replicated. It cannot be duplicated. We're told in verse 18a that the magicians tried to produce gnats by their secret arts, but they could not. When God is at work, beloved, things happen that don't happen anyplace else because they can't. Only God is capable of doing what God is capable of doing. And I think we sell him so short because we're focused on other things. We care about other things and we don't care about this and then we wonder why it doesn't seem like God is very real or why he's not demonstrating some of the power that we read about in this book. It's because we're not ready for it and we're not looking for it. Isaiah 46, 9, remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. All right. So when God is legitimizing his work, it's inescapable, it's inimitable, 
And then lastly, it is identifiable. Verse 19, even these pagan magicians say, that's the finger of God. Beloved, during the times in our history, our own Christian history, when God has done amazing things, you know the one thing that marked it was that the outside world, even though they didn't necessarily believe in our God, they at least looked on it and said, something strange is going on there. Remember I told you about how during the time of Daniel, everybody knew about Daniel's God? And even though they may not have believed in him, they respected him. Why? Because of the kind of person Daniel was and the kind of people that the Israelis were. I think, beloved, that if we could come together and truly believe that God wants to make his name known and make it great and begin to work toward that end, that God would do things that are inexplicable. And I, for one, would like to see that happen. In Exodus 7, 5, I mentioned it before. It says, And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. God wants to reveal himself, and this world needs to know who he is. And we could have a lasting impact. I think we could make a real difference. I, I, I really do, beloved. And you guys come here, and I think the main reason that we come to worship is to have an encounter with the divine, to meet with God. What would you do if he actually showed up? Do you ever think about that? What would you do if God actually showed up for the people that say they're there to have an encounter with him? I think he's ready to do that. Each one of us has a little portion of the temple of God within us. That means that if you're really born again, you have the spirit of God, that same consuming fire, you have it within you. But for a lot of us, we put it in a snow globe to keep it safe so that it isn't dangerous or threatening so that we can live our lives the way we want and we miss out on this God that can do this kind of stuff. What might happen if we were to just say, you know what, let's open the cage and let the Lion of Judah out. You know, one of the most impressive things that I think I ever witnessed when I was young was we landed on the moon. And uh, I can remember, I was 11 years old, Neil Armstrong was the first guy to put his feet on the moon. You know what's interesting is that he left footprints. You can see pictures of it here. And that was, what, 53 years ago. Scientists tell us today that those footprints are still there and that they look pretty much exactly the way they did 53 years ago. You know why? because there's no atmosphere on the moon, which means there's no wind to blow dust over it. There's no water or rainfall on the moon to wash them away. About the only thing that can affect it is what they refer to as um, solar wind. It's a stream of charged particles that come from the sun. And in a sense, over long periods of time, it can act like weather, but it's imperceptible, the change. Scientists estimate that the same footprints that Neil Armstrong left on the moon, a man who's been dead for 10 years, that those footprints will be there should time last that long for the next 10 to 100 
million years. Do you imagine? Beloved, I think God wants to put a footprint down. And we're the boot. We're the boot. We're the ones that he wants to use as a part of this community of faith to make his name known. My prayer is that you want that as much as I do. And that we will begin to figure out how to put away the things that interfere with our connection with him that causes us to start taking that name out there and to see him do amazing things to legitimize his work. Father, thank you for your word. A lot of stuff to think about this week and to meditate on and prepare for. I thank you that you're revealing yourself to me, Lord. In my heart, your name is mighty. I try to declare that to every person that I can. I pray others are beginning to see that, Lord. Open up their eyes, open up their hearts. Help them to reprioritize the way they live so that collectively, Lord, we can begin to brainstorm and to bring our energy to bear, commit our time and our talent and our treasure into making your name known so that reverence can grow. People need to know you, Lord. That's the first step in salvation, I pray. You'd use us to that end. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.